Hello students and welcome to my review video on unit one uh, in our biology class this year at TASM, the American International School of Muscat. This is designed specifically for those of you in the class in 2021 um, and, you know, anybody on the internet that stumbles across this. I hope you find it helpful. I make no money off of these videos. These are just meant to help students. I tried to use all open source material. Um, much of it comes from Khan Academy and that content is available for free at KhanAcademy.org. Let's dive in. As we dive in, just remember bio is equal to life. Life is equal to wow, so therefore bio is equal to wow. We are in unit one. We just finished up ecosystems here. This is the California Living Earth curriculum. Um, up next will be Earth's atmosphere, photosynthesis, and respiration. We'll tie these two together with the carbon cycle. And we have an exciting year ahead. The first uh, couple of days of class, I took you outside of TASM and we did a bio blitz. You tried to count the number of different species that you could find. We had a student find up to around 36 different species. Super cool. So that's a phenomenon. Like what um, a phenomenon could be how many different species live around TASM. Or another phenomenon could be a algae bloom off of the coast of Oman when uh, the water gets really algae. And so we say, um, we'll start with asking questions, right? And these are the scientific uh, practices. What do you wonder? What's going on here? We'll then start working on constructing explanations. And so if we're trying to figure out why there are 36 different species, maybe we'll make a model. We'll start making a food web. We'll see um, what's supporting the different uh, diversity of species here. We can plan and carry out investigations. And that's as many students think of science as, is doing experiments. And then we'll engage in argument from evidence. And this isn't an argument like with your brother or sister or with your parents. This is an engaging in an argument such as in claim evidence reasoning. Our claim is that, you know, we have 36 different species here and we um, were able to support them with our environment, and the evidence. And then what's the reasoning that ties those together? We practice this with the white-footed mouse model. So you can go back in Google Classroom and check that out to repractice that. We started class by reviewing experimental design. So let's dive into a little bit of content here. Um, here we have Francisco Reddy's famous experiment and Louis Pasteur's famous experiment. This one dealt with meat and whether or not flies would spontaneously generate. And this one dealt with, well, um, how does bacteria grow in these flasks um, in this broth right here? So pause the video. Can you describe the independent variable, dependent variable, constants, and control groups in these experiments and remember that these experiments disprove spontaneous generation. All right, for Francisco Reddy's, did you get that the independent variables, the different environments that the meat is contained in, whether or not it's an open container, closed container, or a container with a mesh uh, covering over it. That's the independent variable. It is what is manipulated or changed in this experiment. The dependent variable is the responding variable. And the responding variable here is the growth of flies, whether or not the flies grew. So things that we might have to uh, hold constant. I remember the S in constant for the same. You can also call these controlled variables. They mean the same thing, constants and controlled variables. Well, the same type of meat, um, the same temperature in the room. It's not fair if one room is ice cold and the other one's super hot. Um, the same, uh, you know, circumference in the container, et cetera. The control group is the group that serves as a standard for comparison or the group that is left alone. And um, here, you know, maybe the control group was uh, the open container, like normal, and then the um, independent variable would be the one that was covered up. And so this helped to disprove spontaneous generation. Same thing over here for Louis Pasteur and a swan neck flask, right? And so whether or not the uh, flask had the, um, the curvature at the top or whether or not it was wide open, that would be the independent variable. The dependent variable would be the growth of the microorganisms. So for when it was open, the microorganisms grew uh, rather quickly. Some constants would be the same type of nutrient broth on the inside. Um, what if is, uh, one container had nutrient broth that had a, um, an antibiotic in it or something that killed bacteria or microorganisms? But well, that wouldn't be fair. And a control group is the one that serves as our standard for comparison. So maybe that's the open one. All right, let's review Robert Payne's starfish experiment. So this comes from our HHMI films, um, some animals are more equal than others, is really cool about uh, the green world hypothesis and what's going on there. 
So can you pause the video and remember what was the independent variable, the dependent variable, the constants or control variables and the control group? All right. So hopefully you got that Robert Payne was this young ecologist who would go to these tidal pools and he would take the starfish and he'd throw them like Frisbees, like uh, me, and, um, Mr. Bywater, and Mr. Kelly do. And he would chuck them really far and get them out of these pools. And so that would be the independent variable is whether or not the starfish are there. And what he watched or what he measured as the dependent variable was the resulting biodiversity. So let me show you that here. What he saw is that after one year, the biodiversity decreased. After five years, it became a monoculture. So the biodiversity went way down. Removing the starfish led to it just being covered with mussels. So the dependent variable was the biodiversity. The control group, you know, he might have had another tidal pool where he didn't remove the starfish from for the same five years. Then he could compare his results, right? What if, there, what if the results been caused by a disease, not the removal of the starfish, for instance? Here is, um, this is actually from the AP book, but uh, showing that with the starfish, the control group, right? There was um, a lot more species found over the years, around 20 in these tide pools from 1963 to 1973. And then without it, the experimental group, the manipulated or the independent variable, it dropped way down and became that monoculture. This helped lead to the uh, development of what's called the keystone species. Keystone species is really important to an ecosystem. And just like a keystone, like I'm from Pennsylvania, called the Keystone State, you remove the keystone or the top part of the arch and the whole thing comes crumbling down. So you remove the starfish here and it came crumbling down and the number, the amount of biodiversity really decreased. All right, we're gonna get to do this experiment for uh, as we jump into plants and photosynthesis. Um, how would you set up an experiment on bean germination? Check yourself here on your setting up of experimental design. If you're having trouble with this, with the words that I just used and the way I described it, I encourage you to get help from me if you need it. And also to go check out the Pogel on Experimental Design in Google Classroom. And it's underneath um, the Experimental Design header underneath Classwork. It's a great way to quiz yourself and to look at some more models. All right, we spent the next couple of class periods talking about the coronavirus. I just didn't feel like we could um, be a biology class without talking about um, this you know, transformative event that is happening in our lives right now and how terrible it is and how um, hopefully we are triumphing over it with the vaccines. And so we spent uh, a fair amount of time going over the coronavirus and learning about how it uh, replicates and how it spreads and then how the vaccines work through the HHMI SARS-CoV-2 Virus Explorer. And I really encourage you to check that out and show it to your parents. I thought it was just a wonderful module that we worked our way through. You engage in a scientist circle in class asking questions about it. I'm not going to quiz you on uh, any of the specifics of the coronavirus. We'll get into that more when we get into DNA and RNA, and I'll bring it back up. But what I do want you to uh, think about for our first assessment is, is the coronavirus alive? Right? Many biology classes start out with what is life, and they, we come up with a definition of you know, what are some characteristics of life. And so I think it's really interesting to think about are viruses alive? Here are the uh, characteristics of life that we came up with, and most biologists agree with these. They might add some or subtract some away. Um, and these seven characteristics include metabolism, interdependence, evolution, reproduction, heredity, uh, composed of cells, and homeostasis. So I told you, you don't need to memorize these. You did a little reading article on them and got to practice them in class. And you also, I encourage you to look through the microscopes and to try and find um, some organisms living in pond water and then research them and figure out how they show these characteristics of life. So let's go through each one and figure out if the coronavirus or if SARS-CoV-2 is alive. So does SARS-CoV-2 metabolize? So you can ask yourself, pause the video. Well, what is metabolism? Metabolism is the use of energy, right? And it's the use of energy to grow and to do all the items that we need to as a living organism, whether it's to reproduce cells or to make proteins or to move around. And SARS-CoV-2 doesn't really do that, right? It, it does require energy to um, copy the RNA and to... Um, 
uh, transcribe and translate things. But SARS-CoV-2 itself doesn't really metabolize or um, make energy from food, right? It's not going and eating a donut. What SARS-CoV-2 does, and I'm using the names kind of interchangeably, right? SARS-CoV-2 is the actual uh, virus. Coronavirus is a family of viruses um, of which SARS-CoV-2 is one. And then COVID is the disease that you get from it. Um, so uh, the coronavirus isn't eating these donuts and doing stuff like you might. Does it display interdependence? Well, what is the prefix inter? This has come up a couple of times in our first unit. And it means between dependence, right? So are we, is it reliant upon other things? And for sure. Right. The coronavirus um, here, it's going to it's reliant upon cells in order to reproduce and to then spread throughout the body. And so here, um, just showing an example how it's interdependent, it locks into the ACE2 receptor and then uh, docks into the cell. We can't just block all the ACE2 receptors in our body. Right. They deal with blood pressure. OK, does SARS-CoV-2 evolve? For sure, right? You're seeing these different variants. And the one we're worried about right now is the Delta variant. Um, but there's a British variant, South African variant. Um, and it's kind of a misnomer. People tend to think that viruses always evolve to be worse. And they might not. They might evolve to be less worse, right? And then they would be more able to stick around in a population. This is called a phylogenetic tree. And we will work on these when we get to our evolution unit. It's one of my favorite things to do in class. And this is showing different strains or um, evolutions in a virus. The virus evolves because RNA in and of itself is um, susceptible to errors in copying. So is DNA for that case, but RNA is more susceptible. And so once it has an error, well, that's going to code for some different proteins and it makes the virus slightly different. And that virus may be selected for or against, right? The mutation is random, but natural selection is not. And so if it's selected for, then it'll stick around. And if it's selected against, then that, that variant dies out. So yes, it does evolve at a population level over time. Does it reproduce? Well, this is interesting. It can't reproduce on their own, but it does reproduce with the help of your cells. And so when it docks, it's going to use all your stuff to be able to make more copies of itself. Does it display heredity? Well, what does the word heredity mean, right? Think about genes and think about your parents and what you got from them. And so, yes, it does have a genome. It has an RNA genome um, that codes for the proteins that are going to make it up. And so it does display heredity. Is it composed of cells? Not really. It's what we call an obligate intracellular parasite. So let's look at this word. What does it mean if you're obligated to clean your room before you can play Xbox or go to a soccer camp? It means you have to do it. Intra. We said inter is between, intra is within. So this is obligated within the cell parasite. And a parasite is something that hurts. So a virus is obligated to be within cells and it is parasitic. So it has to be within the cell to grow and to reproduce um, and make more copies of itself. It'd be like if it went to your house and went into your kitchen and made itself a sandwich and then left. It used all of your items. It couldn't make the sandwich and do the stuff on its own. Does SARS-CoV-2 display homeostasis? Well, here you kind of got to remember what the word homeostasis means. And I went through the example with Dr. Walter Cannon and uh, blood shock um, in World War I. And what is homeostasis? It means keeping things the same, right? And all diseases are disruptions to homeostatic mechanisms. And so what uh, Dr. Cannon found is that people were dying, their blood was getting too acidic after they had been at war um, and had a traumatic event happen. And so he coined, uh, he helped coin the term homeostasis for this. And he's able to help uh, save some of these people by making their blood less acidic, by infusing them with uh, a basic solution. All right, viruses don't do this. They don't have a way to control their internal environment. They do not maintain their own homeostasis. They don't display homeostasis. All right, and I got this from Ask a Biologist at Arizona State University, which I think is a really cool website to check out. They write in a way that is um, helpful and good for students to understand. So it's kind of a mixed bag. If you remember, we made a jam board on it. We made a Venn diagram that viruses display some characteristics of life and not others. We know that viruses are really important. About 8% of your genome 
is viral in nature. In other words, it came from viruses. And so we have been influenced by viruses. Viruses have been around for as long as cells have on this planet, and they've been engaged in constant you know, uh, warfare with different cells. There's tons of viruses as well. There's as many viruses on Earth as there are stars in the universe. There's a lot of them. All right, so we've done experimental design, we've done coronavirus, and now we're on to ecology. This is also unit one, right? The experimental design and coronavirus were kind of uh, my introduction to the class, and then we got into the unit of ecology, the study of organisms and how they interact with each other and their environment. What a fun unit. I hope you really enjoyed it. Um, get pumped, right, for photosynthesis and cellular respiration. We'll get to do um, more labs, um, which will be fun uh, in class as well. So here is our anchoring phenomena for this unit, for the ecology part. What determines how many species live in a given place and how large each population can grow? I'd like you to do that for any species that you choose. You should be able to start to be able to research and answer these questions. So after our bio blitz, I asked you on your whiteboards to pick your favorite one, whether it was the mouse. I don't know if anybody saw a mouse, whether it was a bird or a worm or a different type of tree and to try and describe what's going on. That's our anchoring phenomena. I've uh, flashed this on the um, Google slides each day in class. We have a couple of people that are helping us along this journey. Um, Sean Carroll, who is my favorite evolutionary biologist, who does a lot of the HHMI work we'll check out this year. EO Wilson, who is a, um, like a very famous ecologist who dealt with um, Iowan uh, ge biogeography. Robert Payne, who's passed away, but um, dealt with the green world hypothesis and trophic cascades. Corinna Tarnita, who we haven't gone over a lot yet, um, but did some really cool work with um, geometry and with uh, termite mounds. And I just wanted to show uh, how the intersection with math that's in science. And here is Wangari uh, Matai, uh, pardon any mispronunci mispronunciation there. Um, and I should say Dr. Matai, right? She's a Nobel Prize winner, professor, um, doctoral person who started the Greenbelt Movement in Africa and was the first um, African woman to win a Nobel Peace Prize. All right, so we had this big vocab list. And what we did was we developed a bit of the vocab each day in class. And, you know, the vocab is important, but what's more important is that we can use vocab to construct an argument right, to engage in argument from evidence. So let's jump in. We're going to go through the vocab. We're going to uh, practice it all. And then you can use it to engage in an argument. And hopefully you can do this for your parents or for your friend or whoever you're studying with or your brother or sister for what determines how many species live in a given place and how large each population can grow. All right, let's do it. I want you to pause the video after each of these and see if you can do it. And then you can go through my explanation here and our work in Google Classroom. Please, please, please recheck out the work we did in Google Classroom. All right, biotic and abiotic factors. So biotic factors are those that are alive and abiotic factors are those that are not. There's an interplay between them in ecology. Abiotic factors support life. Without them, you couldn't have anything that's alive. Biotic factors help to cycle nutrients back to abiotic factors as well. Um, if you think about it in a science, in a uh, language term, right, bio means life, the prefix a means without, like asexual it means to reproduce without sex, so abiotic means without life here. Okay, can you compare and contrast exponential growth and logistic growth? Can an elephant show exponential growth? Pause the video. Um, and can you also describe what is carrying capacity? All right, let's see what you got. Exponential growth shows a J-shaped curve. It's showing that um, given unlimited resources, populations will grow uh, in an exponential fashion. But we know that eventually everything gets constrained, right? Eventually you run tight on resources. Just think about um, an example if um, there was unlimited uh, resources for say cats here in the wadi at uh, Muscataman. So wadi cats, they start to grow, 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 grow. But at some point they're gonna run out of food, territory, space. And so they're gonna be limited. There's gonna be constraining factors on them. And that is called logistic growth. So this, here's that J-shaped exponential growth. And then it reaches or starts to reach what's called carrying capacity. 
Carrying capacity is the maximum number of individuals that the environment can support at that time. Carrying capacity is not fixed in stone. If we build more malls of Oman and um, reduce the, the area around Tazem, then there's not going to be as much space and area for wadi cats. And so the number of wadi cats carrying capacity would decrease, right? Or maybe the, you know, the, the say a mall gets removed and a place is rewilded, then carrying capacity could go up in some instances. So logistic growth shows that um, exponential growth slows down and becomes logistic as we start to reach our carrying capacity. So you start to reach our finite resources in a popular in an environment. So think about how do humans affect carrying capacity? We really are. Can you compare and contrast R and case selected species? Let me put my head above these. I forgot to animate it. Sorry about that. Um, case selected species, right? They have a longer lifespan. They take a longer time to come to reproductive maturity, and they're going to put a lot of effort into their offspring. Whereas our selected species have a short lifespan and might not put any effort into their offspring. And so a good example of these would be flies. And a good example of case selected species could be humans or elephants. Just because humans are case selected species doesn't mean that we're better, right? Um, flies and bacteria that are our selected species have been around on this earth a lot longer than we have. It's just a, it's the product of evolution and it's a way that organisms work to reach their carrying capacity. Our selected species, as they reach their carrying capacity, can tend to overshoot it and can have um, some population crashes, et cetera. All right, now we're back to proper animation. Can you describe density dependent and density independent factors that affect population growth? Think about what these words mean. Hopefully you got density dependent depends upon the population size. And so these might be things like disease. So if you get a bunch of bats together and they get constrained in a, in a cave, they can pass diseases amongst themselves more easily. It could be predation, right? As they're, you're more uh, pushed together as a denser population, you could be easier um, to become prey for other organisms, competition between organisms, uh, food, water, space. These are all things that depend upon the population size. Density independent would be things like a natural disaster or habitat destruction. This happens regardless of the population size. If uh, Hurricane Ida came through and wiped out some populations in uh, southeastern Louisiana or the wildfires in California, it's independent of the population size. Now that you have the population growth concepts, so exponential and logistic growth, and these vocam uh, down for density dependent and density independent, can you describe the factors that affected the white-footed mouse carrying capacity that we did in class? And I encourage you to check back out that simulation. Here's what it looked like. It's from John Darkow, who's a renowned AP biology teacher. And it's, uh, it was a really cool simulation that we ran through and then you could really manipulate a lot of the items to see how it affected the carrying capacity. And you saw, you know, it'd be an exponential growth curve. And then, it would often level off. And I think the first time you ran it with the parameters I gave you that it, it really leveled off around 37 uh, mice as the carrying capacity there. So this would be exponential. And then this shows logistic growth, that J-shaped curve, and then it clears out. Okay. Let's move on. Food chains. So we did food chains through the lens of Gorongosa National Park in Mozambique. I would love to get to go there someday. Um, just a beautiful safari that you can take. I've been to Namibia, um, but I'd love to make it to the Serengeti, to uh, Gorongosa National Park, to South Africa as well. So much to do, so little time. All right, can you make a food chain? Can you make a food web? How much energy is transferred on average to each level? What, why is this? What are the implications of your findings there? Go ahead, pause the video, check it out. Okay, these come straight from Khan Academy. Here's a good food chain. Algae providing is the primary producer through the process of photosynthesis, taking in sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water, and making sugars that are available for itself. It eats its own sugars to keep itself alive. Mollusks can eat the algae. 
these mollusks can be eat by, uh, eaten by the slimy sculpin, and the slimy sculpin can be eaten by the salmon. All right, and these would be uh, primary consumers, secondary consumers, and tertiary consumers. And you can and also call these trophic levels. And so when you combine together multiple food chains, then you get a food web. And that shows the interconnectedness of organisms in an environment. Once you start combining together multiple food chains, you may see that some organisms are on the um, primary consumer level, and then some organisms are on both primary and secondary consumer uh, levels. And that's a cool feature of food webs. And once again, showing interconnectedness. So here would be like the first trophic level, second trophic level, third, fourth, fifth. Here we call them producers, consumers, and so on. That's fine. What's important to get from this graphic right here is that you're getting 10% of the energy passed on to each level. That's on average. Where does the other 90% go? Well, hopefully you remember that the other 90% goes for the, uh, the bee or the grasshopper, the mouse, doing mouse things. The mouse has got to run around. The mouse has got to go hang out, try and find a mate, hide, get away from predators, go find food. It's got to do stuff just like you need to do things in school. And so it's going to use up 90% of its energy doing that. Even grass does it or the producers, right? They use a lot of their energy to stay alive, to grow, to make seeds, um, to do plant type things. They even send uh, warning signals to each other if uh, predators come. Same for uh, these guys and same for these guys. Because only 10% of the energy is passed on on average to each level, it's hard to find food chains that are larger than six organisms long. Think about it. Like if you can, good for you. But the transferring of 10% of energy to each level limits the length of food chains. And uh, if you can find one that's greater than six, it's usually aquatic or usually a marine food chain um, because there's, there's smaller organisms in the beginning there. Well, um, you know, not everything is eaten by another organism, right? Some of these plants will just die and this mouse might not get eaten by another one. It might just pass away after it's lived this happy mouse life. And so decomposers help to break down uh, dead and decaying organisms and return those nutrients to the ecosystem. By nutrients, I mean elements. And the elements that we deal with in biology are sponge, sulfur, phosphorus, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, hydrogen. And so this carbon atom might have um, you know, been floating around in the air as carbon dioxide, and a plant took in a carbon atom, and then the plant was eaten by this mouse, which was eaten by the bird, which was eaten by the snake. And that carbon atom keeps getting passed on. You might have a carbon atom in you that was once in a mouse or was once in a dinosaur, right? They keep getting passed on in that area, whereas energy flows through a system. All right, energy transfer is only about 10% um, efficient. And here you can see um, uh, where it goes, the, the energy that isn't um, available as food. And so much of it is left uh, lost here by this caterpillar as poop. Um, and a lot of it is used in the process of cellular respiration to generate energy for itself to go do things. So should you be a vegetarian, right? Like think about this. It's, it um, takes a lot of grain to feed uh, cows and to feed chickens for us to eat. Um, and we can get all the protein we need from plants and um, we could uh, feed a lot more people if we just ate a vegetarian diet. So something for you to think about. All right. In the last couple of slides, we had decomposers. So can you describe the brown food web and how that's connected to the green food web? If you're having trouble with this, I encourage you to check out the TED-Ed video that's posted on Google Classroom about this as well. Here's that TED-Ed video. So the brown food web starts with dead or decaying organisms, things like poop or rotting logs, et cetera. And so maybe on that poop or that rotting log grows some mushrooms and then mushrooms can be eaten by you. And so you're only a, a, you know, a step or two away there from consuming something that started with the brown food web. We tend to think um, in terms of only the green food web, but they're really interconnected, right? And so dead and decaying organisms give energy for lots of uh, brown food webs that are interconnected with green food webs. Once again, just showing interconnectedness. Um, one item, and I wish I had made a slide for it, um, that is key to see here is that energy flows through the system and that uh, matter cycles within it. So energy is going to flow through and it's going to leave. 
right? And so if we don't have the sun constantly shining on this grass, we're not going to have as input of energy and we would die. Whereas matter or the uh, elements, sulfur, phosphorus, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, and hydrogen cycle around in the ecosystem. You could, I did the example with the carbon atom there. You know, it can be rearranged into different compounds, but the carbon itself cycles around in the system. I'll try and emphasize that in our last uh, couple of classes. I know I have before. I just, I needed to have made a slide here for it. Can you compare and contrast the green world hypothesis and the bottom up hypothesis for why are trees green? If this is uh, tricky for you, I encourage you to rewatch this video. It's a good one. And I, I think you can watch it with your parents if you wanted to, or your brother or sister. It's really awesome. Right. And it opens with those questions that became our anchoring phenomena. You can kind of see where I took them from. What determines how many species live in a given place or how many individuals of each species can there be? So the green world hypothesis is a little tricky. It means that the world is green because predators keep herbivores in check. And so in our video, the otters kept the uh, urchins in check, which allowed the kelp or the green seaweed to grow and make these uh, marine forests for um, all the invertebrates in the ocean there and the, and the fish. So here, if you take away the, uh, the wolf, then the elk uh, grow, um, un they grow unchecked, they grow exponentially, and they can eat up all the trees. That is the green world hypothesis. The green world hypothesis is that the world is green because predators help to keep herbivores in check. And that's what Robert Payne really worked on um, after he left the University of Michigan. Here, the bottom up, um, which was the prevailing uh, theory at the time, is that the number of producers controls ecosystem structure, right? And I mean, there's definitely some truth to this. If you didn't have producers at all, then you wouldn't have an ecosystem. So here, the availability of nutrients, the number of producers controls structure here. Think about out in the ocean where there might not be a lot of uh, nutrients. If there's a lack of nitrogen and phosphorus, then there's not going to be any plants because they need that for their DNA. And so when those nutrients come along, then you can have the ecosystem develop. Well, let's, um, let's stick mainly with the green world hypothesis. And we use that to practice some ideas of interconnectedness in ecosystems. And we did that with a trophic cascade. So can you describe the trophic cascades represented here? Pause the video. All right, hopefully you got here. Here's our classic example and the one that uh, Lily painted a ceiling towel in our class. It looks beautiful. And we have the otters, which uh, eat the urchins. And so the number of urchins is going to go down. They have a negative effect on the urchins. It, urchins by themselves eat kelp. So they have a negative effect on the kelp. So therefore, otters have an indirectly positive effect on the kelp. Otters, by keeping the urchin number down, let the kelp grow up. And so otters help kelp. And so when the otters got hunted for their furs, we saw that the number of kelp forests dramatically decreased in the Pacific Northwest in the United States. This is, um, these, you know, these arrows, they, you saw them with the food chains back here in food chains and in food webs, the arrows show the direction of energy flows. And this, this is just showing a different modeling system. This is just showing the effect of the otter on that. So I'll always give you context clues for that in the problem. Try this one with the, uh, the bass in the lake. And so this is, um, it adds a trophic level here. Well, the bass is going to eat this fish and this fish eats the Daphnia and then the Daphnia eat the algae. And so if you add these up, a negative times a negative is a positive, And then a positive times a negative here is going to be a negative. So the bass, the presence of bass actually decreases the amount of algae, which is usually a good thing. It makes the lake clear, right? So the bass decreases the amount of algae in the lake. And if you have too much algae in a lake, it can be what's called eutrophy, which can lead it to have that scum over the top and then things can start dying because there's a lack of oxygen in the water because there's no underwater plants. All right. And so here we saw with sea otters and without. Okay. Sea otters are a keystone species. So can you describe what a keystone species is and what it does? 
Well, we kind of went over this earlier in the video, and this is taken from Bio Ninja. This is one of your warm up questions. But if you remove the keystone from an arch, the whole thing comes tumbling down. So here, sharks are often a keystone species. You remove them, and then the rays went wild, and they're able to eat lots of the uh, uh, smaller populations down here. Another example with mountain lions, another example with uh, the wolves in Yellowstone. Now, keystone species are not always apex predators. Most of the examples we have are apex predators, but there's some other ones. And um, an example would be wildebeest in the Serengeti that you could research, or even rinderpest, which was a virus in the, uh, that affected the Serengeti as well. All right, let's keep the vocab rolling. Um, what's a niche? And can you describe the competitive exclusion principle? So the competitive exclusion principle, just to start with that, is that two species cannot exist in the exact same niche, right? They will compete against each other. Um, and this is uh, by Dr. Gauss, and he showed that Paramecium aurelia and Paramecium caudatum grown together, their niches overlap, and they will fight each other. They will compete against one another, and that P. aurelia is the one that survives. Um, interestingly enough, P. aurelia is smaller than caudatum. We tend to think as humans that the bigger um, ones or the stronger ones will always survive, but it might not be, right? P. aurelia, by being smaller, was able to reproduce more quickly and able to eat up the nutrients, and it was able to outcompete caudatum that way. So I didn't get to what a niche is. A niche, the way I described it to use, is it's your job and your habitat. It's your way of life. Your niche is being a student at Tazem High School, right? You could be at any high school here in Muscat, but you are here at Tazem, and that's your job, and that's your way of life. Um, it can be a little, you know, a little more complex than that. It can be the full set of conditions, resources, and interactions that the organism needs or makes use of. And you can pronounce it either niche or niche. Either one is fine. All right, can you compare and contrast a fundamental niche versus a realized niche. Here, a uh, picture will help. So the fundamental niche is where the organism can live. So this is the Catalamus barnacle. And then the realized niche is where it actually lives, where it gets pushed into. So the fundamental niche for you and what school you can attend, you could go to TASM, ABA, BSM, you could go to any school here in Muscat. But your realized niche, because you're enrolled here, is that you are here at TASM. This is where you spend your time. This barnacle gets outcompeted by semi balanus down here. So it cannot take over this area. If semi balanus was removed, then it could take over the whole area. And so that's the difference between a fundamental and a realized niche. When realized niches are shrunken by human activity or by encroachment by other organisms, then that organism's niche has shrunk and eventually it could face extinction pressures. What is your range of tolerance for learning in class? Sorry that this wasn't um, animated. The range of tolerance are abiotic factors that affect your niche is the way to think about it. And so our classroom has been pretty hot. Many of the classrooms around here have been, but we, we have to for COVID safety. If it gets too hot, you just can't learn. If it's too cold, you just can't learn. Your, your, your body is preoccupied with too many other things. Same thing for fish. And so these fish, if it's too acidic or too alkaline, they're not going to be able to live if it's too cold or too hot. There's an optimum range for them to live in. And so these range of tolerance or these abiotic factors affect your niche. They affect your fundamental niche that you could live in. All right. Can you describe niche partitioning? And so if you're watching this video early, we might not have covered this yet in class, but niche partitioning is when species alter their use of a niche to avoid competition by dividing resources among them. And so these uh, species could be anywhere along here, but by dividing up the niche, they avoid competition, they avoid extinction. And so the compelling case study that we'll do in class is we'll look at the grass. And so it's the same grass that you did the nutrient cycling game on. So I think that's a cool little connection there um, in Gorongosa and, and in the Serengeti as well. And so these zebras come along and eat the grass when it's super tall and then Along come the uh, wildebeest and along come the gazelles. And the wildebeest eat when it's a little shorter and the gazelles eat when it's the shortest. And so even though they're in the same area, the same niche, 
the zebras have kind of chopped it down and then the wildebeest and then the gazelles and they're not competing with each other for that plant at the same time. Okay, we're almost there. Um, I appreciate you rolling through the video with me. What is biodiversity, right? What does diversity mean, right? A bunch of differences and we celebrate diversity that makes us stronger and bio means life. So can you describe ecosystem diversity, species diversity, genetic diversity, and how you can help promote biodiversity? All right. Ecosystem diversity is the variety of ecosystems within a given region. We have wonderful ecosystem diversity here in Amman. You have coral reefs, you have wadis, you have uh, mountain ecosystems, all within you know a couple hours drive here of Muscat. It's not only those different ecosystems, it can also be um, the different ecosystems around a certain area, such as, um, let me be clear, the number of coral reefs around Muscat. It's great that we have BK, we have, um, we have coral reefs around Fahal Island and around the Dominions, right? The more coral reefs we have, the greater ecosystem diversity around Muscat that we have. So it's both the types of ecosystems and the numbers, right? It's good to have more coral reefs than less. You can think about biodiversity, like we described in class with the TED Ed video, as a net. And that net is holding life together. The more diverse the system is, the stronger the net is, right? The more diversity in, um, you know, the different ropes and the different organisms that are there, the more resilient the ecosystem is. So it can bounce back from change. We call that ecosystem resiliency. Um, we can, when you think about biodiversity, you probably thought first about species diversity, the different number of organisms in an area. And this is imp it's important to have both a lot of different number of organisms and to have um, large numbers of each types of organism. Now, you know you're not going to have as many apex predators as you would herbivores, but it's not good to just have one lion, right, or just one Arabian leopard. You want to have multiple. And so we can do that through different diversity indexes that account for what we call the richness and evenness of species distribution. Genetic diversity is um, important. And so that means the variety of genes within a given species. And as humans, like we tend to just breed the same cows over and over again that have that produce the most meat, right? But what if a uh, disease comes along that it really affects those uh, cattle? So it's good to have differing uh, genetic makeups in populations uh, so that they can rebound after disease. Um, one uh, population bottleneck of genetics that we went over as an example in class are cheetahs. And so um, African farmers kept making fences and they kept hunting cheetahs to get them out of their livestock. And they've really had a decrease in genetic diversity. Oh, and here's a picture of ecosystem diversity. So I should have shown this earlier. Sorry, here's the mountain ecosystems. You could have forest ecosystems and aquatic ecosystems. And what I was trying to say earlier is that it's good to have multiple aquatic ecosystems, multiple forest ecosystems, multiple mountain ecosystems. Can you compare and contrast primary and secondary succession? And so in class, we watched a quick PBS NewsHour clip on Mount St. Helens erupting, killed 57 people, um, and then it really leveled the area there in the state of Washington in the United States, and we saw primary su succession. A new land is formed, a bare rock is exposed. Um, first of all, some lichens and mosses came, and then those plants died, and they started to make soil, um, and then the soil could support bushes, and then it can support uh, larger bushes and trees and organisms and pollinators, etc. The key point of this is that it takes a long time. Right? So if we destroy an environment, it's going to take a long time for it to come back through primary succession. It will eventually, but it's going to take a long time. And so we really need to think about this with the ramifications of what we're doing with climate change. Um, a good review for this would be to play that Bioman uh, game again that's on Google Classroom. And here's uh, Mount St. Helens. Secondary succession is when there's a disturbance such as a wildfire. And so we're really seeing this in California um, and along and in Oregon and along the West Coast of America. Um, so a fire comes and wipes out the area. There's already soil there. Um, so you don't need those. You might not need the pioneering lichens and mosses, but you're gonna, it's still going to take a while for it to bounce back um, and for it to reach its climax community. 
there's some debate about whether or not there's really climax communities, right? Because um, ecosystems are constantly evolving, but you can think that there is some type of steady state after a while. All right, we're almost there. I know I'm, I'm getting a little tired. Um, hopefully you have taken a, a couple of rest breaks here. Some ecological relationships. And so here we did a pogo on this, which would be really good to review on ecological relationships. So can you give an example of each of the following? And here we go. So ticks eating your blood, right? That'd be a parasite. We're all learning from each other. That'd be mutualism. Barnacle benefits while the whale does not, it would be commensalism. I told you in class that some ecologists argue that there's not very many commensalistic relationships. Usually they're really either mutualistic or um, parasitic. And predation is like the wolves hunting the elk. And we did the example with the lynx and the snowshoe hare in class, showing that as the number of snowshoe hares or rabbits went up, then the number of lynx went up as well, kind of slowly behind. All right. Why should pregnant women not consume sushi? So this drove my wife nuts when she was uh, pregnant. Can you explain biomagnification? And so hopefully you get that um, there might be some type of mercury or some type of pollutant in the water. And we call this a POP, a persistently organic pollutant. It's a pollutant that cannot be metabolized. So it sticks around in the organism. So if each, and we did this model in class where we used, I asked you for a number of one through six, and we drew on our whiteboards, um, the different uh, pollutants bioaccumulating or biomagnifying in a food chain. So here, there's going to be the pollutant in the water. We'll say that it's mercury. The mercury gets into each piece of algae. The algae is eaten by zooplankton, which is then eaten by small fish. The small fish eat a bunch of zooplankton. And remember that they cannot metabolize this poison. Then the small fish gets eaten by the large fish. And so it keeps building up because none of the organisms can metabolize it or get rid of it. They can't poop it out. They can't burn it off. Eventually, it gets into the fish eating birds, and what it does is that it uh, weakens their eggshells, right? And in here, if it was an apex predator fish, like a big tuna or a swordfish, it would have a large amount of, um, or have a bioaccumulated amount of poison in it. And so this was made famous by Rachel Carson, and she endured uh, much sexism and uh, criticism, and she was absolutely right. And she wrote a book called Silent Spring about this. And she said, that, you know, the spraying of DDT everywhere, it kills these flies. And I showed you a video in class of just rampant spraying of DDT. My dad can remember it at picnics, like just DDT trucks just coming up. So those dead flies, you know, they get eaten by birds and the birds bio magnify or bio accumulate these DDT toxins in them. And it weakens their eggshells and then the babies die their baby birds die which would lead towards a silent spring and here's an example of ddt and eggshell thickness so the more ddt the th less thick the eggshells or the thinner the eggshell is which means it's more likely to die okay can you model flows and reservoirs and biogeochemical cycles and so we broke down this word right here bio means life Geo means earth and chemical means chemical. So life, earth, chemical cycles. So in other words, the nutrients or matter in an ecosystem, things like sulfur, phosphorus, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, and hydrogen. Here's the water cycle. So the reservoirs would be like the ocean or lakes or groundwaters. Reservoirs are where the um, water or the carbon or the nitrogen is stored. That's what we call a reservoir. And then evaporation, uh, transportation, condensation, precipitation, those are the methods by which it moves, and those are the flows. I'm not interested in you memorizing this. What I'm interested in you in thinking about is what happens when we manipulate the system. So let's look at the carbon cycle. If we release lots of the carbon that is stored in oil and gas down here, what happens to the system if we rapidly drain one reservoir and if a flow to get back into that reservoir takes a long time what happens to the system that's what i'm interested in you thinking about and learning about as opposed to memorizing flows and reservoirs and so here um one second 
Here is a map, or excuse me, a graph showing uh, carbon dioxide concentration over the last 400,000 years. And you'll see it's varied. And it's varied because of something called the Milankovitch cycles that we'll learn about later on, which is basically how close or how far away the Earth is from the sun and its orbit and its, uh, its axes tilt and its wobble and its precession. But what's important to see is here, look, no matter what you look at, we are now way above previous carbon dioxide levels. In other words, we have gone and taken from this reservoir, the uh, fossil fuel stored down here, and we've put it into this reservoir, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So the question is, is how long is it going to take the flow of photosynthesis or the geological flow of carbon to get back into these fossil fuels? And the answer is a long time. And that's leading to some big changes on Earth. This is a very famous uh, graph called the Keeling Curve. And you can see I uh, ripped it from just the other day, September 27th. And we are at 412.97 parts per million carbon dioxide. Here's a nitrogen cycle. Nitrogen cycle is pretty tough. Um, I'm not going to uh, ask you about that on your test, but um, it's worth checking out. There's a great Explore Learning gizmo on it um, and, and how it works. Some items that we didn't get to this year, but which are uh, interesting and that we can think about is um, eutrophication. And so if you look right here, this is a eutrophied lake. And so there was an influx of too much nitrogen or phosphorus that could be from waste. It could be from fertilizer runoff, et cetera. And this happens in Oman as well, right? As the wadis are full of goat poop or other poop and uh, waste and get rushed into the ocean with a rainstorm, there could be an algae bloom event. These algae blooms, as they start to die off, they are, get eaten up by bacteria. And that bacteria consumes all the oxygen in the water. And that causes the water to become what's called hypoxic or really lacking oxygen, and it can lead to the death of fish. And if you've been in Oman for a while, a couple of years ago, there was a big fish kill and it like covered marinas with dead fish and Azeva Beach was covered with dead fish from this. All right. Um, and this is a cool paper about it from Salt and Caboose University. Hopefully we'll get to this uh, later on uh, this year. So that was a long video, almost an hour. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found it helpful. Um, but can you, now that we've gone through everything, can you go back to our anchoring phenomena? Can you use this list of vocab to uh, talk about what determines how many species live in a given place or how large each population can grow? Maybe you really like turtles. Maybe you really like whale sharks. Can you use uh, this video and these vocab items and everything we've done in class to construct an explanation of that phenomena? Students, as you study, do the practice problems, look at the study guide, but remember that studying really happens just by doing the work in class, by engaging in every single activity that a teacher gives you, by trying the homework, you are studying as you go along. It's so much stronger to do that than to try and cram in at the end. Good luck. Take care. Have a good one.